Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jens Chapman. Welcome week seven of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, hopefully things are starting to open up again. Uh, it's a beautiful day outside and um, welcome from Seattle and Rainier country. Uh, here are my disclaimers for the CME approved um, uh, presentation. And as we're looking at the beauty of nature restoring itself in May 2020, hopefully the golf courses will populate soon again, and hopefully we'll have our great courses at SSF uh, restarting in the near future. Uh, the camaraderie, the closeness, uh, we'll have to obviously see, but uh, the learning experience um, in vivo with our cadaver courses is unparalleled, and uh, we're looking forward to the return to that We've had a great time doing these STED talks uh, in the interim, and today we're going to talk about odontoid fractures, one of the many unanswered questions. Uh, our STED talks, again briefly, they're about spine, technology, education, and the three Ds of discovery, discussion, and debate. So this is part one of two of odontoid fractures with a special mention of geriatric fractures, the fractures that affect older patients. And what's the fuss about? This is indeed one of the smallest bones. It's not even a bone by itself, it's a bony prominence. And to uh, talk about this later, we'll have a couple of cases, but just to show this uh, off, this is a real life scenario. This is a 95 year old lady who's living by herself successfully, and she crashed a car in a 35 mile zone at 60 miles per hour. She's neurologically intact and had no head injuries. And if you look very carefully, there is indeed a fracture of this little bony prominence. That's the bone we're talking about. So the question will be, in the context of these two presentations, what would you do about this? So this is the bone in question, this bony prominence, uh, this little thing that arises out of the second uh, neck vertebrae. If you looked at our talks the last couple of weeks, you know what an integral part uh, as an anchor of the upper cervical spine relative to our skull this bone has. So we'll talk about population dynamics a little bit and some of the physiologic factors. And again, we'll have Dr. Shell interrupt my talk with some updates as to classifying it, or putting some structure into our thoughts and observations. And uh, then we have, I believe, three of our fellows discuss what happens in cases. And again, the special emphasis will be on anatomic reconstruction and also to answer the question of what happens if we ignore it. And we have Dr. Oskuyan and other faculty members here, and some of the cases will be from Dr. Oskuyan. But one of the big questions is how can we restore physiology? If you look at this patient who's given me permission to show her picture, by the way, she's a long-term patient of mine, um, I noticed something very bizarre when I worked at Harborview, and that was that uh, over time, these odontoid fractures seem to become more and more common. And if you look at the blue lines, over time, the patients above 60 started to rise all of a sudden. So in my own lifetime as a spine surgeon, suddenly there was a dramatic shift starting in the 1990s, and it basically became very profound that older people had a rise, whereas younger patients actually declined in their numbers. So this is something that uh, really was profound because odontoid fractures were known to be a high velocity injury from car, motorcycle crashes, serious sports injuries, falls from heights, et cetera. But the new face of odontoid fractures truly were elderly patients who would fall in the most deadly of ways from ground level falls. As we know, society is changing and becoming grayer in many, many countries around the world. And again, this is a new era where we have patients who are elderly who are very different in their manifestations. They're not just, quote, the elderly. They are patients who are amazingly vivacious, like that 95-year-old lady that I just showed with a car crash. And then there are patients who are very feeble, and they may actually be in their 60s or sometimes in their 50s with many comorbidities. So to see whether this hypothesis, this observation uh, that there were more elderly fractures uh, were happening, uh, we set out to a formal assessment of our state of washing discharge database. And this is done by Ronan Bletcher, seen in this picture with many of our uh, wonderful fellows from last year. He's now in Israel as an attending, and he's remained uh, an active uh, investigator with us across the oceans. And so he did this uh, formal data search and this has been accepted for publication in the European Spine Journal. And the premise of this is, again, that we all know that osteoporotic fractures are actually one of the major societal burdens uh, in our times and in our society here. This is, again, a well-known publication uh, feature that shows the overall socioeconomic burden. Uh, 
And again, the incidence of these fractures is clearly related to advancing age of patients, both male but especially female. You can see in this green line the hip fractures rising once we're getting past our 60s into 65 and 70s territory. And so this dynamic is basically changing over time and we can actually see a shift in time of the actual incidence of these fractures as the population uh, growth and dynamic changes will occur. So what we found in our study uh, in Washington State, which was uh, so far unparalleled, was that there's indeed a dramatic rise over time of total spine fractures. So basically from about 2003 to 2017, we identify a near doubling of the actual fractures. The total discharges in the state of Washington rose from 590,000 to about 655,000. And again, the number of spine fractures actually doubled in this time period. When we looked at which area was most affected, we also found, much to our surprise, that the cervical spine, the neck, was the most uh, affected area. And then when we looked at that relative to other fractures, such as uh, hip fractures, we could find that without a doubt the spine fractures basically had a much more significant rise in terms of their numbers uh, rather than hip fractures. So the geriatric fractures disproportionately hit the spine more than other areas. When we looked at which actual age group was most affected, we could see a clear rise of all of these spine fractures, neck, thoracolumbar, lumbar, and lumbopelvic in the neck area and in the patients who are above 70 and 80 years old. So there's no question that the 70 and 80 year olds get spine fractures, which are now, in our state of Washington at least, one of the most uh, uh, problematic fractures. Now when we looked at what kind of fractures in the neck were the most common, they revolved specifically about the second neck vertebrae and the odontoid, as you can see in these rising numbers here. So the cervical two and odontoid fractures are clearly on the rise. They are a socioeconomic problem. So this is the bone in question again. And one of the problems is that we were constructed with a relatively small little piece of bony prominence that, as I said earlier, serves as the anchor, seen in this diagram here, of our skull relative to our neck. And we unfortunately have not been given the mammoth type uh, odontoid process, which we see right here in a uh, fossilized model. This is actually a real fossil of an odontoid of a mammoth. This is a mammalian bone that uh, is very commonly seen basically in all mammalian species, together with a seven neck vertebra, regardless of size or height of the um, specimen or the species. But our odontoid is relatively frail. And if you look at it, it basically ranges in size of our little finger, I'm specifically using my little finger here, from that second knuckle downwards. That's the size of an odontoid in most patients. Some patients have one that's almost thumb size. So the dimension is somewhere between thumb and little finger size. And this is the anchor of our skull, to repeat that concept. Now, so we've established now with Dr. Bletcher's very nice study that's not been done in this detail to date, that the over 70 years are clearly identified most commonly as uh, victims of this, and the most common mechanism is something that's very trivial. It's GLFs. GLFs, ground level falls, are the main problem. And obviously, these are, again, very problematic patients in terms of having many other medical issues with them. These are not just solitary little isolated fractures. There are many issues, as we'll see in some of the great case presentations we've prepared uh, for you later. So uh, the other problem in elderly patients is that they're frequently missed injuries. The statistics are still not quite there. We're actually looking at that right now. But probably about a third of patients, depending upon where you place the threshold, have a delay in diagnosis of probably about two days or more. The other physiologic phenomenon, and we'll hear about that a little bit more by, I believe, Dr. Schell, is the osteopenia or the osteoporosis, the loss of bone stock in this bone. This is a cross-section of an odontid that we did, and I think it shows very well in this waist area right here how there's just a hollowing out of the bone. So right in the area of the waist of the odontoid is over time also a concurrent loss of bone structure. This is again one of those cruel uh, missteps of nature, if I may second guess nature here, uh, where we basically have this high demand area in this small bone, concentrated in this very small bony prominence, somewhere between thumb size and little finger size, that's then hollowing itself out over time through osteoporosis. Biomechanically, it also serves as a pivot point. So the odontoid is the pivot area where basically our cervical one and occiput is pivoting or rotating around uh, the spine and the head. 
And very commonly, we see something that's not really been well described. It's called atlanto-odontoidal arthropathy. Now, that's a mouthful. But basically, that peg in its junction to the first neck vertebra is starting to get arthritic. Like many other joints, it's starting to get arthritic. What is, however, not happening is that the two small joints on the side, the so-called atlanto-axial joints, are actually not encumbered by this disease process. So they remain mobile, they remain non-arthritic, and then when there's a fall with a head impact on the ground, the logical sequence is almost that this failure point happens right through the odontoid. Now, diagnosing this is or supposed to be uh, very simple because we actually just need to have x-rays. But on those x-rays, it can be very simple to miss these. And again, what is very clear now is that we should get CT scans on these patients. A CT scan will show if there's an abnormality and there's not a huge radiation burden anymore that can be obtained very rapidly and relatively inexpensively. So in my own generation in medicine now, there's been a total paradigm shift where we still use x-rays, but the art of, for instance, getting a so-called open mouth odontoid where you have to have just the right angle and hopefully not much dentition in there to obscure your image. Uh, to try to see the odontoid tip somewhere in there, as you'll see, this is pretty confusing, or try to make sense of what's going on here on this lateral x-ray. This is a goner nowadays with CAT scans. This is a patient who had a hypertrophic non-union of an odontoid fracture with a severe obstruction of the spinal cord. We'll probably show his case in a later presentation. So a lateral C-spine still remains probably the main uh, study to obtain to look for alignment. The CTs are the clear standard of care. An MRI can be obtained when there's any form of neurologic abnormality or ligamentous anomaly. And again, in this particular patient, with this CAT scan showing that there was an ununited fracture, the MRI scan suddenly shows how badly the cord is impinged. One thing that we had to learn from CAT scans is how important it is to have these so-called reformatted views where the computer puts together the pixels in a three-dimensional fashion so we can artificially scroll through the spine. Because it's pretty easy on the standard axial cuts to miss an odontoid fracture, such as seen in this case. So in the earlier generations of CAT scans, when people did not get these reformatted studies, um, they were actually pretty easily missed on CT scans. Nowadays, with modern reformats, that should not happen. And an MRI is, again, important for uh, ligament injuries. We talked about that, and if you've missed it, hopefully you'll look at that in our Atlas fracture talk last week. In our STED talk last week, we talked about how it's difficult it can be to see the TAL, the transverse atlantal ligament that locks the odontoid into place. There's a TAL injury in this yellow circle right here. But again, this becomes somewhat guesswork. This is not straightforward. Now, I'm going to interrupt my talk because Dr. Schell is going to take us into what we do once we have this diagnosis made. And this is a really big deal. Uh, and I'm going to just make my talk small. I'll put my mask on for this exchange. I have washed my hands, not touched my face. You saw that, Dr. Schell, right? Yes, sir. I'm trying to get your talk to get bigger here. So I'll step aside. Here are the controls. <clears throat> so I'm Ben Schell. I'm one of the uh, spine fellows here. Uh, I'm going to run us through some of the uh, common classifications of odontoid fractures and then uh, some of the uh, confusion that can come along with this. Hmm. My, my screen's just spinning. Is that what yours is doing? There we go. Uh, so something to remember uh, kind of from way back, the embryology classes that uh, we took in medical school is how the um, how this bone develops from the beginning. So some of the ossification centers, uh, you know, there's five of them. And then when you look at this uh, and then kind of intuitively, we can look at the classification systems uh, that we've been using and see how some of these fractures develop uh, and see why there could be some instances where these fractures are developing in more common places and why some of the earlier classification systems uh, came about the way they did. Uh, because you have these ossification centers that are then growing out, and then you can see areas that may not fuse as well or as <clears throat> strongly as when the um, ossification centers, uh, the center themselves, where it actually originated. Uh, and then this is a, just a lateral view um, of the same uh, principle, and then something that kind of stumbled upon uh, through you know my years of training is there's a lot of people that um, 
still think that the dens itself may have been a remnant of the C1 ring. And so that's why we commonly get, um, you know, fractures here at the base, at the waist here, because this part of the dens may actually, in fact, uh, you know, be a remnant of C1, uh, but then it, it didn't exactly fuse there, and so now it's fusing down at C2, uh, and that may be, um, you know, why we get more commonly placed fractures there. Uh, and so then the other thing that kind of contributes to all of this is the watershed area right there at the base as well. Um, you have, you know, decent blood flow through the body, decent blood flow blood flow through the tip, but then right there in the middle of the waist, um, not great blood flow. And then uh, as we'll show here in another slide, the type of bone as well uh, actually plays a role. Uh, and that's what this slide's showing. Uh, this is uh, you know, from a paper uh, by Course in um, 2017 where they look at um, the, actually the types of bone that are making up each of these in cadaveric dissection. And so what these all mean, uh, the uh, bone volume, trabecular volume, BBTV, uh, trabecular uh, interconnections is the one on the right, and then that cortical thickness. And kind of the takeaway from this is um, the bone volume at the waist, uh, right here in the middle, I don't know if you can see my cursor, yeah, the bone volume right there at the waist is less, and then the cortical thickness is still making up a large percentage there. So you're not getting a lot of support for that thin cortical bone, and it just predisposes to fracture. Uh, and that kind of uh, leads us to the one of the you know landmark papers uh, in spine, uh, the Anderson D'Alonzo classification, um, you know, been, been declared by JB, JBJS uh, as one of the classic defining papers in our field. Um, and these are the big uh, three classification that they came up with uh, at the time. Um, this is uh, you know kind of important to note. This was actually pre CT, uh, so they didn't exactly have a lot to go on, and we've uh, we've learned a lot uh, kind of in the coming years. This was later modified uh, to the Grauer classification, where they looked at specifically by uh, Grauer and Vaccaro. They looked at specifically type two and tried to make that even more specific because the more high definition the three dimensional scans got, uh, the more we were able to parse out the different um, types of fractures that were coming about, and uh, you know important with every classification system is, you know, if it dictates treatment, then, uh, you know, we should, we should parse it out, and that's kind of what was happening here. Um, and then, to kind of make a long story short, uh, slowly over time, six and even seven classification systems have been published and, uh, you know, somewhat validated in the literature. Uh, this is a brief review. Um, uh, Chorus uh, published this as well, uh, where he came up with another classification, uh, and this was the review paper of the previous six. Uh, Anderson de Alonso's on here, Grauer's on here, uh, the Roy Camille uh, classification as well. And so it, it's just a, it can be, the waters can get very muddy very quickly. Uh, and so that's kind of where the AO steps in and uh, makes a comprehensive, uh, this is a busy slide, so we'll try to parse it out here in the next couple, and really look at how this can be an all-encompassing classification system and really uh, help you dictate treatment and help us talk the same language among research because that's what, where the, um, the waters can get very muddy. And you look at old classification systems is where we're all talking about the same fracture, but we're all using different verbiage. Uh, that can get confusing with treatment, that can get confusing with, especially with research, at looking at outcomes. And so if we're all using the same verbiage and the same classification, and we're all talking about the same fractures, uh, it makes things a little more straightforward. Uh, so, if, sorry, if you look back here, um, you know, it's, it's a classification that looks at the upper cervical, but we're going to only focus on C2 uh, today. So types 1 and uh, type 2 over there on the left, uh, we'll ignore those for now. <clears throat> We've been over those in previous talks, and so we'll focus on the type, um, type 3, which is C2. And so it uh, kind of abides by an AO principle of looking at A, B, and C. Uh, they like to put them in the big buckets, and so it will... Uh, help us isolate to A, with the bony injuries, uh, B, looking at tension band, and then C, anything where the vertebral body is translated in directional plane. Uh, and, you know, kind of the initial reaction some people may have is that, well, what about a odontoid fracture where the odontoid is displaced anteriorly? Wouldn't that be a translation? Uh, it's actually not. Um, technically, that is a bony injury, and because the vertebral body is not translated, uh, it actually falls into the A uh, with the bony injury as well. And so the big takeaways from this, uh, if you really look in the classification and get down to it, the things that are really gonna make a difference in our practice and research and outcomes are gonna be the modifiers. And so this is, some of this comes from experience, some of this comes from 
uh, looking at the overall patient picture, which is going to be very important uh, for treatment and for surgery and for outcomes, uh, especially these modifiers on the right, uh, where you know things at a high risk of non-union with non-operative treatment. Uh, so something that traditionally may be you know a type two odontoid, uh, maybe you know uh, at a high, maybe an M1 in this system. Um, so it's a. Uh, if you look back, it would be a type A, but then an M1, they're probably neurologically, neurologically intact, so an N0. So it, it really gives you a lot of information uh, and it can really help you um, direct your treatment and direct your research and specify your outcomes if we're all talking about uh, the same thing. Uh, and then I would be remiss to have a talk about classifications if I did not throw in a slide of my classification that I'm trying to work on. Um, any and all help can be appreciated on the SSF website. I'm developing a multiple rod classification system um, to uh, really help us, like I say, uh, talk the same verbiage, use the same language, look at all research, look at all outcomes. Uh, it's the MROX classification system. Um, it can actually be found on the AO Fellows website now as well from the BAMF forum and then uh, the SSF website as well. So any and all help would be appreciated. Thanks. Good job, Dan. As you're, if you don't uh, mind just answering one question or so, as you're heading to South Carolina and summer to start your practice there, what system are you going to use? Because if you start talking about an AO type, uh, a category three type 2A, something like that, our radiologists, our ER doctors going to respond to that. What are you going to teach uh, those uh, around you? Are you going to use the AO system or what's the purpose of that, do you think? So, so I think I think in the interim, as um, you know, personally, I think the thoracolumbar uh, AO classification, since it's been out a little bit longer, has been more widely adopted. So I think that's probably more easily acceptable. I think right now, I think people in, especially in the community, when we get calls from outside hospitals, are still using Anderson De Alonzo. And so I think while we're in this transition period, I think I will try to. You know, yeah, that's what that is and that, but this is a better description of what you're trying to use. And if we just keep teaching and teaching and teaching, then I think it's what the What right was idea. the main problem of the Anderson Alonzo system? If you look at it just statistically speaking. Uh, so it doesn't really incorporate all of the fracture types. It, it, it's putting them into two large buckets. There are, especially type two, there are a lot of different variations there. And then you're not able to uh, dictate treatment based on these because the fracture may, well, it may be kind of be a two, but it's also a three, and you can have a fracture that starts as a two and then propagates into the exactly. body and becomes a three. So it, 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 the, the classification is, is harder to parse out because you could be talking about a fracture that has parts of type two and parts of type three and is a unique fracture by itself. So for my criticism, there are three buckets of fractures. A, uh, type 1, type 2, type 3, or A, B, C, in a way. The type 1s are actually exceedingly rare. Mm -hmm. People have questioned whether they actually exist. So you basically, a priori, throw away one whole category of fractures by having an exceedingly rare injury, which is important because if you have a type 1, we're obviously worried about a yeah, ligament injury. Ailer ligament injury. Ailer ligament, ligament yeah. devulsion, so potentially catastrophic craniosurgical injury. Type 2s? Are very common. Type threes are different because they go through this vertebral body, mm -hmm. so they have a better healing chance. But if we look at it carefully, the distinction between type two and type three is so hard because those darn fractures kind of divot out a little bit. So for me, the indistinction of the two main categories are a problem. Why is a type three so meaningful therapeutically? If we go ahead and look forward a little bit to non-surgical care, what makes a type three so appealing as opposed to a type two? It's got, it's got better blood flow. There's much more trabecular bone there. And so there's a much higher incidence of it healing just from a bony standpoint. And it's, uh, if, if it's involving more of the cortical area and the trabecular area, there's a lot more um, chance for blood flow to propagate across that and induce healing. That's just the problem with type twos is it's just too, more, too much cortical bone, too thin a cortical bone and not enough trabecular support. So it's, it's well done. more stable. Thank you. Thanks. So I'm going to move ahead quickly with the um, uh, perspective of odontoid fracture care. And again, uh, we're going to talk about uh, briefly non-surgical care and what that means or what it could mean. And then we'll have three great cases uh, to be demonstrated.
So non-operative care basically means that we have some form of a collar on and hope that the fracture kind of sticks together, or we can use a so-called halo, as seen in this very active patient on the right-hand side. The history of the halo and the odontoid fracture is actually intricately involved with one another, uh, with uh, Dr. Nickel, who basically started this for polio care in the 1960s, and it was then refined for odontoid fracture care. And again, this was something that was, uh, you can see Dr. Nickel right there in the picture on the right-hand side. Um, and it's obviously something that we've used um, over decades now, but it's become far more unpopular because if you look at this severely traumatized patient on the bottom, it is very hard to put that kind of a patient, possibly with head injuries, into this kind of a ring contraption that then has a vest attachment to the body. So this is something that basically remains very much in doubt now. And this is actually a pretty amazing picture. These are the parents of a girl that I treated who had an odontoid fracture. And her parents, both in a car crash, had odontoid fractures. The mom was treated with a Minerva cast, which is really not done anymore. And the dad was treated with an early generation halo. So these are actually parent pictures. We thought that the family history was so amazing in this regard. The halo has uh, received so many uh, question marks around it, but in fact, it is the most rigid form of external immobilization. And again, you can see in a number of earlier biomechanical studies that it does provide a restriction of mobility of the neck that is probably better than any and all other devices, but it is by far not perfect. And a lot of uh, material has been written about the complications from halos. And you can see the classic ones. These pins that engage in our skull can loosen and uh, make the whole construct wobbly, cause pain, disfigurement, even cranial penetration in worst case scenarios. Um, dysphagia, swallowing difficulties uh, can be a very big deal. And again, pulmonary things where patients aspirate or get pneumonia. So if we look at non-operative fracture for odontoid fractures, this has been, again, published quite a lot. And basically, the nutshell is that there is a reported rate of non-unions of somewhere between 10 and 77 percent. So this is a pretty wide variety. And you can see, basically, uh, a number of the variables that authors came up with over time on the right-hand side. Nothing totally consistent, but there's some general themes. So at Harborview, we did actually do a lot of halos, and my former partner, Dr. Rick Bransford, did a beautiful retrospective study over seven years with almost 300 patients with uh, type 2 odontoid fractures being prominently amongst them. And again, here you can see a standard regimen where basically under fluoroscopy would attach these, and we would then, with the patient sitting up, have them do a swallow test with water, and with a fluoroscope, we'd make sure that the odontoid stays in place with, between sitting and recumbent positions. So in this HALO study, these are the kind of injuries that we had. And again, the odontoid fractures did feature prominently. There's a wide distribution of age, but we did use it in patients above 70s and 80s, as you can see on the right-hand distribution curve. And when we looked at this, we actually found that the halo did not do so badly. Uh, basically, this drop-off of the curve on the right-hand side is at the three-month mark, where we intended to take it off. But the key thing is that there was a drop-off uh, in terms of complications where we just could not continue with the halo that occurred early in the treatment, between one and two weeks. So if patients, and that was the conclusion of our study, failed, they would actually fail very early on in the vast majority. So um, what we found was that pin tracts were manageable, but it requires a very regimented kind of a setup. It's a lot of work. Uh, one in three patients with a halo fail. So you can see this as a good news or bad news thing. But most failures happen within the first two or three weeks. So if you wanted to try to do a non-operative treatment, you could usually predict very reliably at the, month, at the week two or three mark if something would not work. So for select patients who want to avoid surgery or where the uh, doctors want to avoid surgery for whatever reason, it can be considered. And again, roughly a 75% success rate can be quoted, and most of the patients who will fail can be seen early on. Now, this is the patient that I showed earlier. This is a spinal cord injury with long-term myelopathy after a non-union. One legitimate question is what happens if we don't treat these odontoid fractures? Do they actually deteriorate or can patients kind of go on without this bony anchor of the craniocervical junction? And again, in this patient, this is a pretty remarkable story. This is a 76-year-old patient when he came to me, and he was actually a former Viet Cong soldier who had an odontoid fracture and was treated for six months in an underground hospital uh, with traction first. 
and then with a halo kind of a contraption at bed rest. So he spent six months in a very claustrophobic environment, I'm sure underground, and he was declared healed by his uh, doctors. And he then came uh, to the US and emigrated here, and we found that the fracture had actually never healed, and he developed a non-union. He's a very tough man. We did surgery on him. But this was a case that basically required surgery. So when we look at what Dr. Schell just very eloquently identified, I basically came up with the FDA questions for uh, odontoid fractures, the fracture level and comminution, the distraction and the direction of displacement, and the angulation questions. So in a little bit more detail, if you have a distraction of a fracture of three to five millimeters, that bone is probably not gonna heal even with the best of halo treatments. That will probably need surgery. If you have an angulation like to the side here of more than five degrees or even five degrees, same thing. The amount of disruption is probably significant. This is where I'll disagree with Dr. Schell. This is a type C injury. So at this point in time, this bony injury actually becomes a type C injury, meaning there's a ligamentous displacement that has happened around it. So and any combination with an atlas fracture or a torn transverse atlantal ligament is probably also a really bad prognosticator. If patients have a significant deformity of their chest or of their neck, it is inconceivable to try to treat a patient, for instance, with this odontoid fracture with a halo. We tried it, and again, it just did not work even as a temporary stabilization, as you can see, I think, very evidently. And it's inconceivable that this patient will go through his halo wear if we indeed were to pursue this without aspirating, meaning get fluid into his neck. This is the odontoid fracture of this patient. These are attempts at reducing him. And obviously, if you have very large patients, it is similarly inconceivable to try to have the vest somehow find purchase. So now, if we go into a forecast, and this is where I'm gonna close the lecture part and we'll go to lecture, so I'll ask Dr. Kitane to get ready with his laptop. Um, uh, if we do a forecast over time, and we published this also, we found that surgery became clearly far more popular. If you look at this plot diagram, you can see over the decades that surgically treated patients uh, really became far more common than non-surgical patients and eclipsed the 50% variety. So this is the case I started us with, and I'm not gonna leave this unresolved. Uh, this is the case number one I showed you, this 95-year-old car crash lady, and my question was uh, what to do. And the big discussion as to what we'll do will come next week with the great odontoid cliffhanger, so please tune in next week when we'll systematically look at surgical techniques. But I'm now gonna uh, switch computers, and we'll bring Dr. Katene on, who's gonna talk about one option of odontoid care. Good morning, my name is Dr. Bilal Kutina, one of the Spine Fellows at Swedish Neuroscience Institute. 60-year-old male, before four months, fell down into a pool and landed on his head. Diagnosed with C2 dense fracture, treated with rigid cervical collar. He had continued constant pain in his neck and he is generally healthy. On his exam, no sensory or motor deficit. His x-ray at the time of injury on open mouth view, hardly we see the fracture line. So after 10 days of continuing pain, he underwent CT. On CT, we see non-displaced fracture type two of the dense. Coronal, also non-displaced fracture, and on axial, we have non-displaced fracture. He was treated with rigid cervical collar. At four months of follow-up, this is his x-ray and the open mouth view, we see the radiolucency on flexion extension, no instability. And on CT, increased fracture gap due to the absorption of the fracture. Coronal CT, increase in the fracture gap and on axial CT. Now regarding the treatment, we have anterior and posterior fixation. Anterior odontoid screw preserve the motion of C1, C2 at the risk of more dysphagia and less fusion rate than the posterior. The fusion rate in anterior odontoid screw is about 80%, 85%. In posterior cervical, it is higher. What we did, anterior odontoid screw, normal operative course, post-op CT, reduced fracture with bicortical fixation of the screw, coronal cuts, 
and this is his follow-up uh, post-op five months. He had healing of his fracture, and he is doing well. And he stopped smoking before and after surgery. And his coronal showing reduced fracture and healed fracture. Now, few points, keys to success in this uh, type of surgery. First of all, patient and fracture selection. It is very difficult to do this surgery in patients who had short neck or parallel chest or cervical kyphosis or thoracic hyperkyphosis. Fracture selection, usually it is classic for grower type 2B. So the screw will be perpendicular to the fracture line. Also, it can be done in the transverse fracture line, while as in the grower type 2C, it, is, it shouldn't be done. And also in patients who had osteoporosis or comminution of the fracture or transverse ligament injury, it is contraindicated. We have to use biplanar fluoroscopy, AP and lateral, positioning of the patient in the supine position with guarded well, tongue traction and extension of his head to reduce the fracture. And the most important is suitable screw entry point, which is at the anterior lip of C2, not in the body of the C2, and correct screw trajectory. Thank you very much. Great. Can you go back? Good job, Bilal. <coughs> yeah. Can you go back to the fracture when we had the CT that showed the delayed union? So, Rod, you're the surgeon on this. Uh, so, this is beautifully done, but what happened? How can a single little screw into this bone make a difference, and why did this not happen, uh, uh, heal? I mean, this looks perfectly aligned. He's in a rigid neck collar, he was compliant. So what happened? No, actually, just the opposite. So I actually, um, he had the injury, I can't remember, but I think it was in Mexico. Yeah, he, he um, A diving accident or yeah. a construction accident, I can't remember, one or the other. Yeah. And he had a CT there. This and, is his city. Yeah. yeah um, and the surgeons in Mexico wanted to operate on him right away. Um, but, you know, there it's fee for service. And so he flew back um, and he ended up, I can't remember, he saw a neurosurgeon and said, oh, you're fine. This will heal. They put him in a collar and then did plain x-rays, kept him in a collar for three months. And then said this is healed, and then at about three or four months post-op, he started increasing neck pain, inability to, um, you know, uh, basically turn his head when he's driving. Um, he actually had pretty severe Learmead syndrome, and um, the neurosurgeon that had seen him sent him to me um, and had proposed doing a C1, C2 fusion, but then it was kind of controversial because I saw him at six months and here you have a non-union and someone who smokes who um, doesn't want to have a C1, C2 fusion. Um, I don't know what the right answer is. Um, and I told them that it was probably like, if you looked at the literature, it's like 50-50. Um, but I do want to find out what people in the room think, especially Lincoln. Oh. Yeah. So um, I, I, I wanted to ask a question in reality regarding the case, and is when do you decide to do a double screw for the odontoid? Um, uh, anatomy, yeah. So that's a great question. Um, if you can look at the coronal, some of it is anatomy. So he was pretty, uh, he had a very barrel chest. So it's very difficult for me to get the screw to point a little more, you can see it was kind of posteriorly projected. And, um, you know, uh, it depends on how much, you know, we probably could have maybe got another screw in, um, but I felt like we got good fixation and um, it was a bear to try to even get this one. He's a huge guy. Well, uh, can you forward um, a little bit um, uh, or maybe backwards? Yeah. So this is uh, beautifully done. The, the question that you asked uh, was addressed by Dr. Sasso. He both did a biomechanics study, our good friend, Dr. Rick Sasso, and hopefully you'll see the SSF TV broadcast he's done. Um, he's done a beautiful job with uh, comparing one and two screws, and he says biomechanically there's no big difference, and clinically there's no difference. Um, technically, I disagree. If you have an unstable fracture, and having done a lot of odontoid screws, 
uh, if you have hard bone and you engage what Dr. Oskui did so nicely here, the far cortex with the upper tip of that screw, there's a clear spin-off risk, uh, meaning where the odontoid starts spinning off. Uh, and so that's something that you want to avoid. We'll have to move forwards. Uh, we have two more case presentations, but uh, this is beautifully done. It does show the power of stability thank you. and compression. So thank you, Bilal. And next we'll have Dr. Heyman, then we'll have Dr. Jimenez, both show cases of what happens if you don't do something with an odontoid fracture. Um, so my name's Eric Hamm, I'm a fellow here at Swedish, and uh, I'm going to discuss a case of a uh, chronic non-union in a uh, very late octogenarian. Um, so uh, the patient that we're going to discuss today is an 87-year-old male uh, who presented with a known history of a type 2 dense fracture um, with a chronic non-union. Now this patient was diagnosed with a dense fracture, it seems rather late in the course. Uh, reading through the notes, it looks like he'd actually um, been diagnosed with a fall uh, with a fracture once it had reached the chronic phase. He had fallen several years ago, um, had some neck pain, then about a year prior, um, had another fall with severe neck pain. This had been managed with soft collar and muscle relaxants. Um, finally, earlier this year, um, he was worked up with a proper bony imaging and diagnosed with, this, this, uh, with a chronic uh, fracture of the odontoid. Um, because of his advanced age and apparent lack of instability, um, he was given a soft collar. However, despite this, um, over the subsequent time period, he developed worsening difficulty, particularly with gait instability and increasing falls, as well as urine retention. Uh, this had progressed by the time he reached us to frank inability to walk um, for about a week. Uh, all his patients, 87, he's what I would consider to be a very young 87-year-old, very robust gentleman, looks much younger than his age, um, some mild medical comorbidities, hypertension, sleep apnea, CHF, BPH, but overall a pretty healthy guy despite being nearly 90. Um, on exam, while he didn't have significant gross motor deficits, he was known to be frankly spastic in all extremities with uh, pathologic reflexes. Um, bony imaging uh, demonstrated a very chronic appearing uh, mothian kind of fracture um, through the, the, the base of the dens uh, with significant panis formation on MRI, which I think explains this patient's overall high grade myelopathy type picture. Um, so I think this brings up an interesting point uh, because uh, there's a, certainly a trend towards tolerating non-union of odontoid fractures, especially in the elderly. Um, if you read a lot of these papers uh, advocating for treatment of these patients with hard collars, they typically argue that these patients, even if they don't heal, will develop so-called a stable non-union, a fibrotic non-union. Um, but a lot of these papers have a relatively short-term follow-up, one to two years, and they don't ask what happens four or five years hence. Um, and I think in a certain proportion of these cases, these cases need to be followed because what will happen is this, you know, the body as it attempts to heal this non-healing fracture um, will build up ligamentous material and scar tissue behind the dens with the resulting compression at C12. Um, this gentleman, because of advanced age, had some other uh, interesting anatomic features. Uh, he had hyperlordosis at the base of the skull um, and ankylosis below. Um, in addition, he had a very tortuous vertebral artery anatomy, um, which was not favorable for either really a lateral mass screw or a C2 pedicle screw. Um, the verts were very close to the, the canal in terms of lateral mass, giving a very narrow trajectory. Um, the uh, posterior arch of C1 was uh, very thin. Um, and the pedicles uh, were very small, and again, in close relation to the vertebral artery. Um, 
This obviously complicated, so there are a number of features complicating management of this patient. Clearly you have a patient who's deteriorating with a um, compressive lesion in the context of this, this glacially unstable fracture. Um, the patient's of advanced age with you know, a high risk for surgical fixation, I think by virtue of his age. Um, in addition, his anatomy is not favorable for a relatively standardized approach to C12 fusion for the reasons I discussed, both bony and arterial. Um, palliative care was obviously engaged to discuss goals of care, but the patient, I think appropriately, said he was fairly active before all this and um, fairly healthy, and he would like to get a shot at getting back to that. Um, the real question for this case came down to the operative plan. Um, you know, although we would like to do a C12 fusion, um, we had a very frank discussion with the patient and it said this may be a case where we have to go do an occipital cervical fusion and bypass the complicated anatomy at C12. Um, in terms of fixation techniques, obviously our preferred technique here is um, a nerve root sparing um, posterior arch based lateral mass screw at C1 coupled with a, a pedicle screw at C2, um, but he may not be a candidate for that, and, and we, we discussed that with the patient as well. Um, ultimately, we were able to achieve uh, a sort of uh, oxput sparing approach. Um, despite the apparent uh, lack of a robust C1 arch on a CT imaging, um, he actually had a fairly I would consider robust C1 uh, lateral, I mean, um, posterior arch on when we actually exposed intraoperatively, and uh, we were able to place C1 screws uh, without significant difficulty. Um, for C2, we decided to bypass our traditional uh, pedicle screw and set opted for a laminar screw for, again, the aforementioned reasons. Uh, laminar screws are always good to keep in mind. Um, from a biomechanical point, they provide a uh, a strength similar to uh, pedicle screws. Um, incorporating them a construct is a little bit of a challenge because their entry points are uh, deviated from the, the, both the lateral mass screws at C1 and down below, um, requiring the length of cross links that has to be planned for. Um, but in a, in a case where a pedicle screw is not an option, laminar screws usually can be placed. Um, finally, because he was ankylos below, we decided to incorporate these extra points of fixation in the form of lateral mass screws. Um, with a good surgical result. Um, from a recovery perspective, uh, despite his advanced age, uh, the patient did quite well and was discharged on post-operative day five to a sniff. Of note, he did complain a little bit of bilateral occipital neuralgia, which required management with gabapentin. I see Dr. Escudian smiling over there. <laughs> but, uh, but overall, I think the important points to take home for this case are one, a CTA is invaluable. Um, you know, it's something that might be overlooked, but in terms of planning, uh, it's, uh, in this case, it was very insightful in terms of uh, avoiding a potential complication, particularly with C2 pedicle screws. Um, and I think the other important thing is, you know, with these fusions, although C12 fusions have become the standard of care, um, using the, the standard harms construct, lateral mass screw C1, pedicle screw C2, there are other options. In this case, we were able to exercise a successful C1-2 fusion using laminar screws, but um, we were certainly prepared to go to the occiput, and uh, you know that remains a valid option in cases where a C1-2 fusion can't be safely performed. All right, perfect. Any questions? Not right now, thank you. If Dr. Jimenez spent the last 10 minutes in another case. Thank you very much. It's a very nice presentation. Good morning, my name is Lincoln Jimenez, one of the Spine Fellows. I'm gonna to present today a case of, um, uh, of uh, a delayed treatment of odontoid fracture. Initially, the patient was treated conservatively. So the case is a 72-year-old uh, male who had, um, um, after a full ground-level fall, uh, developed posterior neck 
Uh, however, uh, during that uh, trauma, he did not have any type of issues in terms of myelopathic changes or radiculopathic changes or any weakness at all. Um, the patient uh, did have, however, when he presented later on, some bilateral lower extremity foot weakness and gait dysfunction as well as right foot cramping. Other than that, uh, he also was having increased oral secretions and shortness of breath. Uh, this was about a month, a month and a half after he had the ground level fall. Um, uh, as I said before, no uh, non neurological deficits were present at fall. And then uh, on past medical his history, the patient did have chronic nicotine abuse, uh, also had some Huntington disease with uh, some movement uh, issues, and um, uh, arthritis um, as well as hypertension. Uh, the other issue he had is that the patient did have some issues to uh, be transported. The patient was in Alaska and uh, had some issues to be transported to Seattle. Initially, he was consulted and it was decided to be treated with conservative management, including uh, a heart collar, uh, which uh, unfortunately uh, the patient was non compliant. On imaging, as we see here, we have a um, uh, type 2 uh, uh, odontoid fracture uh, with uh, no major uh, um, gaps uh, nor displacement in this patient. He also has some arthritic changes. As I said, he also has history of uh, arthritis. And uh, at the time, um, uh, it was uh, considered to be a stable fracture. As I said, uh, hard color, but he was non-compliant. Uh, despite the fact that uh, he was told to uh, stop smoking, uh, the patient did not uh, comply with that either. Uh, later on, uh, this was uh, the, the last images were in November, December. Uh, later on, the patient did develop um, did, uh, was being followed up with Imogen, and he was seen with a major gap um, uh, progressing over the Imogen. This was in February 2019, uh, which was already concerning for us, and uh, he was consulted to the Seattle um, uh, Swedish uh, spine team, uh, and it was decided to bring the patient for examination, but unfortunately, due to transportation issues, he couldn't get to uh, Seattle. Uh, this is uh, later on when the patient was decided to be brought because of progressive neck pain and weakness as well as balance issues. We already see that the patient is already having a major gap here uh, and just a slight posterior uh, displacement of the uh, distal portion of the odontoi. Uh, so the question I had myself is what could have happened to this patient and just based on uh, Dr. Chapman's presentation, um, you know, I, I found that uh, one of the things, of course, uh, he had a, a gap which was a little bit uh, more than one millimeter uh, progressively. Uh, of course, uh, the inability to maintain a reduction mainly because the patient was not uh, using his, uh, his uh, collar. Uh, other thing is that, of course, his age was not helpful and he had a chronic fracture for which, of course, he was not, uh, he was not going to fuse that. Uh, other than that, of course, smoking is a major factor for, for non-union on these patients and the, the reason that uh, he's a male. Back in 2013, there were some uh, factors that were evaluated and, and the three major factors that actually came up to be um, uh, more important for non-unions uh, was the age, uh, the gender, and um, uh, the, uh, the, the um, a gender and the chronicity of the of the fracture itself. So, um, uh, for the most time, non-unions, of course, do have a 10 or 70 percent. Just depends on the literature that you read. Uh, but uh, 10, or 10 to 70 percent of them will not heal on conservative management, and uh, they have a posterior displacement. The chances are that 70 to 89 percent of them will not heal at all. Uh, so this patient was uh, evaluated, of course he was kept here in Seattle when we saw this and his clinical symptoms. Uh, and uh, he was brought to the OR and he had a, a C2 in terms of a pedicle uh, screw placement, uh, C2, C1 uh, fusion. Uh, 
at the end, uh, fortunately, the patient uh, uh, did very well with regards to the uh, neck pain. Uh, did not have much change on the gait, unfortunately. Um, but uh, he still lives independently. Unfortunately, he continues to use tobacco. So that's, uh, that's the end. I don't know if you have uh, any questions at all. Thank you. This is a very evocative discussion. And maybe I can ask Dr. Heyman to come up also. <clears throat> Do you have a mask on you or? When, okay, then keep your distance, but come up front. So question to both of you, if you go back, um, so this is a very nice surgical repair, but go back a little bit more to one of the, yeah, like this here. What would you have done differently at that point in time? So, so I'll start with Lincoln. Um, if you can give him some spacing, yep. um, Dr. Litvak, his coat. Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> so Dr. Jimenez, uh, so what would you have done differently? Then I'll ask Dr. Heyman. I mean, it looks nicely at position. So, um, so what's wrong with waiting a little bit longer? Uh, waiting a little longer, well, I, I think that uh, with this, he would have actually developed more uh, ligamentous uh, problems, I would say, more resorption of that distal portion of the odontoid. Uh, that's what I think. Um, I think that with time, uh, he's got some resorption of the distal um, um, uh, a portion of the odontoid, and that's that's why he's becoming uh, or having some uh, neurological deficits already because it's an unstable. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, if that uh, was yeah. the question. And Dr. Kittany showed a very nice odontoid screw before on a delayed union where there's a good apposition of bone. Um, uh, Eric, Dr. Heyman, what do you think? If you can space a little bit there, Dr. Heyman, just step aside a little bit. Um, thanks, since you don't have face masks on. Um, so. Is an odontoid a screw something that you would do in your frac uh, in your practice in the future in uh, South Florida? You know, odontoid screws are something I read about a lot as a medical student and made perfect sense. You know, of course, you fix the fracture, right? Um, but you know, uh, you know, back home at Shock Trauma and, and here, you know, um, there are a lot of very experienced cervical trauma surgeons who don't do a lot of odontoid screws now, and uh, that's something that's always puzzled me. Um, but, you know, the actual, the more you think about it, the more I thought about it, the, 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 the actual indications for it, I think, are, are, are very slim, you know. These well-opposed fractures that will heal without surgery in young people, um, or potentially heal without surgery, don't need it. And then the older people, I think, for the reasons that have been discussed earlier in, you know, Dr. Shell's talk and, and your talk, um, you know, uh, probably won't heal with an odontoid screw. Um, so, I, I mean, for a select patient perhaps, but um, I, I just, I don't think the indications are there. With Let's see, Dr. Oskuyan, yeah. you did an odontoid screw before. You did a beautiful job and it healed. Why not here? Does this fracture resorption worry more? Is this a patient that you'd consider using it on? So, um, do we have flexion extension x-rays again? This is not one that I would recommend an odontoid screw because uh, it looks like the arch of C1 is fused to the odontoid. And um, there's probably some element of, of instability that um, is not recognized just on the CT scan. When there's a gap that much, Usually there's enough translational forces that I think, and again, it looks osteoporotic, but this is definitely one that I would highly advise that you don't put a, a, a dontoid screw. Now, if it was acute and there was maybe a sliver of a fracture, yeah, um, but not for this case. Great. So the hour has come to a close. We have no resolution between what to do. There's a lot of trouble about a little bone that's somewhere between this size to this size and any and all of us, and it does cause problems, we can't just ignore it. Having a clean treatment paradigm is still somewhat elusive as the two cases of delayed in care, delay in care and diagnosis of uh, Dr. Jimenez and Dr. Heyman illustrate very eloquently. Dr. Katane showed a very nice case of Dr. Skouyans with an elegant fixation that is however difficult to do. So a lot of trouble about a little bone. Let's continue next week, same time, and talk surgery in greater detail with a couple of case presentations. Thank you all very much. Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button for more medical content.